group will focus on the topic of whether technology threatens the future of special education and ABA. Our members include Sarah Parsons from Ireland, Mari Card Friedman from California, Kaylee Garrigus from Wisconsin, and my, myself, Liz Vega from Washington. Applied behavior analysis is an evidence-based treatment for autism and other developmental disabilities. However, access to services by those living in rural areas is scarce. Web-based deli service delivery has increasingly been explored in other fields and has now been used in the field of ABA to train parents and other care providers. Similarly, advances in technology has helped even the playing field for students in special education. It has also allowed students with disabilities greater access and opportunity to progress in general education curriculum at all levels of education. Our group will specifically look into whether technology teaches the necessary social skills to a client, whether it does, does not or does take place in a natural setting, and whether treatment is valid or given with fidelity. Sarah Parsons will take on the role as a stater for both sides of the argument. Mari Carr Friedman will argue about the threats of using technology, and then Kaylee Garrigus will talk about the benefits of using technology in ABA and special education. And I myself will be the moderator. First, we will have the stater discuss her points and counterpoints in her opening statement, and then we will transition into stating the pros and cons of the argument of our debate. We will then move on to the attacking points from both sides, followed by questions from the audience. We will wrap up with the stater summarizing a closing statement, and then I will provide the conclusion of our debate. I will now transition over to Sarah, our stater. According to the Mayo Clinic, autism spectrum disorder is a serious neurodevelopmental disorder that impairs a child's ability to communicate and interact with others. It also includes restricted and repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. These issues cause significant impairment in social and occupational and other areas of functioning. Autism spectrum disorder, also known as ASD, is now defined by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, as a single disorder that now includes disorders that were previously considered separated. The Asperger syndrome disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive developmental disorder. The term spectrum in autism spectrum disorder refers to the wide range of symptoms and severities. Furthermore, the number of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder is rising. It's now estimated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that one out of every 86 American children will be diagnosed. ABA is a treatment option that has been shown to dramatically decrease the symptoms of autism. Autism Speaks, a globally recognized autism research and support group, describes applied behavior analysis, or ABA, as a set of principles that form the basis for many behavioral treatments. ABA is based on the science of learning and behavior. This science includes general laws, about how behavior works and how learning takes place. ABA therapy applies these laws to behavioral treatments in a way that helps to increase useful or desired behaviors. ABA also applies these laws to help reduce behaviors that may interfere with learning or behaviors that may be harmful. ABA is used to increase language and communication skills, and it is also used to improve attention, focus, social skills, memory, and academics. ABA can be used to help decrease problem behaviors as well. ABA is considered an evidence-based best practice treatment by the U.S. Surgeon General and by the American Psychi Psychological Association. Evidence-based means that ABA has passed scientific tests of its usefulness, quality, and effectiveness. ABA therapy includes many different techniques. All of these techniques focus on the antecedents of what happens before the behavior occurs and on the consequences, what happens after the behavior occurs. One technique is, is positive reinforcement, 
When a behavior that is followed by something that is valued or a reward, that behavior is much more likely to be repeated. ABA uses positive reinforcement in a way that can be measured in order to help bring about meaningful behavior change. Today's debate discusses whether technology is a threat or an asset to ABA and special education services. The technological advances at the forefront of the debate are computer-based interventions, or CBIs, distance learning, internet-based parent trainings, and virtual reality interventions, all of which are used by, used by professionals, teachers, parents, and clients who have autism, and clients who have autism. Based on the National Standards Project criteria, CBIs are an emerging intervention. Its research has not, had, its research has some success, but is still fairly new. Much more research must be done to be, before its findings can be described as an established intervention. Reading, history, math, and nearly every other subject has been taught using a computer. But can a computer help teach academic, social, verbal, and concentration skills to children with autism and special needs? Some say yes, while others say no. The pro side of this debate believes that this technology is a threat to the quality and accessibility of ABA treatments. The argument that technology is a threat to the quality of treatment stems from the fact that as of now, many teachers are forced into selecting IEP or ABA treatment goals from a pre-made goal bank rather than being able to write individualized goals for each student. Furthermore, it will be argued that there is little evidence showing that virtual or computer experiences can be generalized into real life experiences. And lastly, many teachers report that they do not have access to the internet in their classroom, and a large number of their students do not have access to the internet in their homes. Meaning that if online programs became the mainstream way of managing treatment, many teachers, clients, and parents would be left behind with no way of accessing the support that they need. Opposingly, on the con side, believes that technology is an asset to the quality and accessibility of IEP programs and ABA services. They will argue that computer-based interventions are extremely effective ways of reaching rural areas and giving one-on-one -on -one interventions to inter individuals who live in hard-to-reach locations. They'll argue that computer-based interventions help teachers and professionals create, maintain, track, update, and share IEP and ABA goals with fidelity. They will also argue that educational and ABA virtual reality experiences, which give an immersive, natural feel to an environment that has been contrived by the educators, are shown to be welcomed and enjoyed by students with and without autism and teach many skills, including social mimicry. The con side will argue that simply because the entire population hasn't yet caught up with the technology, it is not a reason to stop preparing for the future. Now we will hear from Mari Carr Friedman and Kaylee Garrigus, who will discuss about the threats and benefits of using technology in ABA and special education. Hi, my name is Mari Carr Friedman, and I will be arguing for the side that agrees that technology is a threat to the future of ABA and special education. My first point is supported by an article written by C.M. Moore and J.E.H. Barnett in 2014, which discusses some of the specific challenges in using computerized IEP goals for students in all-inclusive classrooms. The application, the application facilitates for teachers in the writing of IEP goals and the objectives. However, this is done by selecting generic pre-written goals from a goal bank. The problem that this creates is that the goals being developed for these children become more standardized and much less individualized. Important in the field of ABA is its compliance with the ethical code stated by the BACP and the practice of creating standardized goals with a lack of individualism is in violation of ethical code 4.03 individualized behavior change programs, which states A, 
Behavior analysts must tailor behavior change programs to the unique behaviors, environmental variables, assessment results, and goals of each child. Because they are generically created, teachers have found it very difficult to match a goal to the student's learning, behavioral, or social needs. Most of the time, these programs also don't have goals generated for traditional standards such as self-help, social and emotional, behavioral and transitional goals. Another problem that these generic goals create is that they're typically pretty wordy and awkwardly written. Oftentimes, they're also not written in a way that's clearly observable or measurable. In compliance with Ethical Code 2.09, Treatment Intervention Efficacy, we must provide treatment that will help the child achieve their IEP goals. Teachers have reported that oftentimes, selecting options for measuring goals don't work, and default mastery criteria can't even be edited. Accuracy is another concern with the IEP programming. If information is automatically entered based on the demographic information that's originally entered, it will consistently be incorrect throughout the entire IEP process. These mistakes may require a system input change, which is not typically in the teacher's field of competence. Information may be lost in this process or cause a computer error, which requires more training for the teacher and causes time, time constraints. If a teacher can't fix these errors, a tech support person will have to do this, and this may be in violation of confidentiality, which directly violates code 2.06 maintaining confidentiality. Specifically, behavior analysts have a primary obligation and take reasonable precautions to protect the confidentiality of those with whom they work or consult, recognizing that confidentiality may be established by law, organizational rules, or professional and scientific relationships. Hi, my name is Kaylee, and I will be arguing that technology is an asset to ABA and special education. During an IEP, a team of professionals come together to discuss the individual so they can create a plan to make them more successful. Ideally, meeting with a team face-to-face -face for unlimited amount of time would be the most beneficial in making the IEP, but for larger school districts with heavy caseloads, it can be extremely difficult to coordinate schedules and collaborate. Using an electronic IEP streamlines the process. An electronic IEP completes mundane activities like filing in the child's information into the form and scheduling when the next IEP should be done, which saves time for the team members. Electronic IEPs save time is that some have a component that they can be shared online. So the team can access the IEP, add their input, and overall optimize their time at work. The goals that are chosen can be copied and pasted into a progress review very easily, and comments can be made to give more details on goals that are not specific enough. For my second point, I believe that technology may not improve social behavior significantly more than traditional methods and that it fails to allow for generalization and maintenance on certain skills. In 2013, Ramdas et al. discussed in a systematic review of past research how computer-based interventions have been used to improve social and emotional skills with those who are on the autism spectrum. For such a promising practice, there were several limitations found in most use of technology. First off, most of the past re much of the past research has concluded that outcomes with computer-based programs are variable. An analysis of past research indicates that computer-based programs have mixed outcomes for the areas of social and emotional skills. A majority of these studies also report low outcomes following intervention indicating that there's little information which tells us whether individuals with ASD can generalize social and emotional skills following CBI treatment in real life situations. It seems that additional face-to-face -face training is still needed for these skills to stay maintained in the real world, which is where behaviors will actually occur. Another major limitation includes the lack of consideration for preferences and the existing abilities of these individuals with most computer-based programs that are again generic and lack the individualism in treatment. 
Similar results were found again in 2016 by Alan Hartley and Kane in a study that, conduct, that was conducted to test if iPads can promote learning for the names of objects for children at ASD as opposed to a regular picture book. While they theorized that because iPads would minimize the social distractions and allow full engagement for the child for learning, those who used the iPad did not significantly make more improvements than those who learned using the picture book. There seems to be no advantage gained in using electronic platforms as opposed to the less costly and more traditional methods that help promote spontaneous communication in real life settings. I wanted to conclude this point by reviewing again the Ethical Code 2.09, which directly relates to treatment and intervention efficacy. As stated in my first point, treatment must be validated as having both long-term and short-term benefits to clients and society. It's not enough to provide treatment if skills are not being maintained or generalized in a real-world setting. Although the articles indicated that a computer-based intervention was not always consistent with their results, I believe that in some areas where one-on-one -on -one services are not available and teachers are not trained on how to teach particular skills to individuals on the spectrum, CBI is a great stepping stone to teach the skill. If a teacher is unfamiliar with the content, they could always review what the child is doing and then find ways to generalize the skill to the real world. CBI is also requiring the student to move on with the lesson, so it will work on compliance as well as negative reinforcement when they answer questions correctly. The study ensured that the student had to make a response or interact with the computer to be included in the study. The student could have an issue with compliance and this affected their experience learning social skills. Computers also may be less aversive to the child compared to academic tasks. In general, education programs are incorporating more technology into lessons. It could make the child their peers. In school districts where they are unable to provide special services to students with special needs, this is a viable option instead of no therapy at all. For my final point, I argue that technology is a threat to children who live in rural areas and many schools because they don't have access to computers and other devices that are needed to teach the lessons demanded on the curriculum. In addition, many teachers have negative perceptions and attitudes towards the use of technology in their classrooms. In a study by the Pew Research Center, 2,462 teachers voiced their opinion on the use of technology in their classrooms. Although many agreed that they had been implementing technology into their lesson plans and that technology had a major impact on their career, their student's accessibility to digital tools has been very low. Only 54% of teachers reported in their, that their students had sufficient access to digital tools while in school, and a mere 18% of teachers indicated that their students had access to technology while at home. When referring to access to technology, the article quotes, rural teachers are less likely to say that their students have sufficient access at home. Another important point to discuss are the extra demands being placed on the teachers who are required to use technology in the classroom. 75% say that the internet and other digital tools have added new demands to their lives, including learning more about the technology, requiring more work on their part to be an effective teacher. 85% of teachers are finding themselves seeking out their own opportunities to learn new ways to effectively incorporate these tools in their, in their teachings as the formal school trainings are not sufficient. Although this study examines the availability of technology for general population students rather than for special education students or ABA clients, the fact remains the same that in general, Rural areas have less access to technology. Ethical Code of Conduct 2.05, Rights and Prerogatives of Clients, comes into play on this factor, stating that A, the rights of the clients are paramount, and behavior analysts support clients' legal rights and prerogatives. I take the stance that without providing the required means for learning, such as using technology that many students don't have access to, is in violation of the client's rights to an appropriate learning environment in the classroom. 
Code 2.09, treatment intervention efficacy, would also be violated due to requiring mastery of the school curriculum without providing the means to do so in a rural area. Like previously stated, the study looked at access to technology of general education students. This information may be skewed when looking at special needs children if they use communication device or the child has an interest that has easier access online. These could increase the likeliness that the child has some type of technology in the home if the family can afford it. The study also does not specify what digital tool is being asked of. The student might be able to go to the local library to use the desktop computer, but not have access to an app exclusive to an iPad. The data collected was all self-report and not actual reporting of students that could use technology. With self-report data, it leaves the opportunity for the teacher to present their bias on the matter and sway the results. If a teacher is not knowledgeable on new technology options, she would be less likely to ask of her students or incorporate it into her curriculum. The results of the surveys can also be misleading. Although only 18% of students of teachers reported that all or almost all of their students have access to digital tools, 54% of teachers said that most of their students have access. Together, that would be 72% of the survey teachers reported that it is highly likely that their students would have access to technology at home. The few students that do not have access could be assisted in finding accommodation to assignments or use the community's resources. One of the community resources is the school which 81% of teachers said that all or almost all of their students have access to technology. We will now move on to the con side of the argument, which Kaylee will be presenting the research for. I will be using a peer-reviewed article by Heitzman Powell, Batard, and Miller in 2013 in which it discusses families who live in rural areas who used web-based trainings to implement applied behavioral analysis strategies with their children with autism. The web-based program the parents used is called OASIS Training. The parents are required to complete online activities from home and participate in video conferencing skill training sessions at a local school, community center, or hospital. The training program helped to build the capacity for ABA therapy in areas where it never before existed. The parents have reported that they have felt more comfortable after successfully completing the modules using behavior modification techniques. The parents' comfort level might make them more likely to utilize their new skills with their child. It could also lead to the parents being and follow a BCBA's behavior plan if they lived at a distance. The skills could be taught in a natural environment, which would lead to more generalization. The graph shows the scores of the parents who participated before the training and after. All of the parents showed improvement in their scores. The Heitzman Powell et al. study that Kaylee presented showed that some improvements were made in parents' skills knowledge of ABA. However, there were only four families that participated, which raises the question of how many times these results have been replicated and whether or not these results truly generalize to other populations. In addition, the average age of the parents participating was 37 years old, the oldest being 47. My concern here becomes the older generation of parents and grandparents who are caregivers to children with ASD who are more unlikely to be familiar with technology. These families also conveniently had computer access to learn from the program, but what about the families that do not have access to this resource? One major thing to note on this study was the lack of maintenance sessions. I wonder if the parents maintained their skills weeks after learning occurred. The graph showed that parents increased their ABA knowledge and similar results have been replicated in other studies. However, I would be curious to know how these results would compare to face-to-face -face teaching. A study showing a comparison of OASIS to face-to-face -face training would be a helpful insight. I also found it ironic as well that not every parent scored over 80% in the domain of structuring the environment for learning. 
This seems to be a skill that would be much easier to master with an instructor in the home while modeling how this should look. This concern reminds us that computer-based learning is not always comparable to learning in the natural environment. Lastly, the study didn't include any pretest prior to the teaching of each module, which makes it hard to truly measure how much knowledge was gained. Most importantly, there was no data collected on the child outcomes. While the parents may have learned how to teach ABA, we don't know if OASIS is an effective treatment method for the child who is really the one needing services. There are many different technology advances coming out that have a goal of improving deficit skills, robot models, computer games, and virtual reality, to name a few. One of those explored is virtual reality. Forbes, Pan, and Hamilton in 2016 discovered a new way to use VR to teach children on the spectrum imitation skills. Ford, Pan, and Hamilton stated that mimicry is an important social behavior that is modulated by social cues. The ability to mimic comes naturally to neurotypicals, but must be taught to individuals with autism spectrum disorder. The ability to mimic improves quality of life through improved social interactions and can be taught using virtual reality technology. Stormy interaction is an interactive game designed to teach and monitor mimicry behaviors. Tables that participants copied the, the height of the avatar's movements despite being instructed only to copy the goal of the observed behavior. The results of using virtual reality are impressive, but this brings two questions. We'll Nuba et al. in 2016 evaluated the client's willingness to wear a headset, accept virtual reality experience, as well as sense the sense of presence and immersion in virtual reality. All 29 to wear the headset for the first phase, which included three VR experiences. And all but four decided to continue to phase two for the last two VR experiences. The four that dropped out reported that they were uncomfortable with the virtual reality not this. The ethics code 2.09 is in question because since VR shows results toward improving imitation skills and individuals tolerate wearing the headset, it would be the most effective treatment compared to no therapy at all. While the Forbes, Ham, and Hamilton article supporting Kaylee's second point shows how virtual reality can be great for teaching social skills to high-functioning adults with autism, I wonder about the portion of people with ASD who are lower on the spectrum or who are much younger or earlier learners. The sample size of participants was extremely small with no diversity at all, all of them being employed Caucasians. The use of virtual reality raises the concern of a limited natural environment setting with limited avatar demographics and movements. The avatars could resemble the person using the program vaguely, but the look is very generic and the body movements were restricted to arm and body gestures and mouth movements. Another concern with this study was the lack of baseline data collection prior to the VR SCT sessions. Only a basic pretest, which does not measure consistency in responding prior to treatment. There was also a lack of maintenance data collection to see if skills were being maintained. Instead, they used a questionnaire filled out by the participants to know if it was being maintained or generalized. Additionally, there was no mastery criteria for each session, only a post test after every session was completed. And because this was a pilot study, we don't have any replication to strengthen the findings. One major difficulty with the use of vir this virtual reality program is the lack of a standardized published measure for rating personal, emotional expression, facial expression, or speech, with, which is what is being taught for mimicry. This creates a huge challenge in data collection and measurement, not to mention making mastery difficult to determine. These are all key aspects of ABA and must be addressed in the future te of technology in ABA if it is to be continued as a practice for treatment intervention. As for the new but at all, 
study used in Kaylee's final point, I think that the experimental design would have been much stronger if it were an AB or an ABA research design, showing data from the virtual reality sessions and data from face-to-face -face sessions to measure if there was actually a difference in responding. However, these differences are not compared, so it's pretty difficult to determine how significant of a difference virtual reality sessions are as compared to face-to-face. -to -face. There was also no baseline data collected on each participant's current responding to mimicry, as well as no data collected on whether the skills gained generalized to face-to-face -to -face mimicry opportunities. No follow-up maintenance data was collected either to see if the skills were maintained at all. Lastly, the participants with ASD did not mimic to the same extent that the neurotypicals did. Accuracy of exact gross motor imitation is an overall goal of mimicry, and this is not achieved with the participants of this study. The fourth article I will be using is from Chai and Demiris. The authors conducted a systematic review of studies that involved telehealth interventions in the care Giver interventions that were found in the review that used telehealth tools included education, consultation, psychosocial, cognitive behavioral therapy, social support, data collection and monitoring, as well as clinical care delivery. All of these are used abstractly in ABA or in special education. The review included video conferencing, phone call or text, electronic data collection, and web-based information as examples of telehealth. More than 95% of the studies they found consisted of parents and families reporting that they are satisfied and are comfortable with telehealth. It also goes into saying that telehealth can save families a lot of money and still be provided with efficient training. Ethic Code 2.02 .02 Responsibility talks about the importance of taking responsibility for all parties who are affected by behavioral services. This includes the individual's parents as well as the child. Training the parent therapeutic techniques help not only the child but also the parent. I see some important limitations with Kaylee's third point on telehealth, which should be brought to light. My first concern is that not all families will have access to the technology required for these virtual reality programs. My second concern is that some children may require further help to mimic, including systematic prompts, which incorporate partial or full physical hand-over-hand -hand guidance if the skill can't be taught with a lesser prompt. Along with prompting, these programs also do not include implementations of DDT, chaining, or reinforcement contingencies. These are all key aspects of ABA intervention and special education. On top of this, only 37% of the studies focused on educational behavioral intervention. So most of the articles in the study do not apply to the unique field of ABA or special education. Aside from these limitations, other training that focused on problem solving were most commonly delivered via video conference or telephone, which may not always be accessible to everyone. The authors reported many of their own limitations, which included challenges with data collection, a small sample size for the study, no comparison to face-to-face -face interventions, no significant difference between telehealth and in-person services, and non-reliable questionnaires, measuring the attitudes or satisfaction towards telehealth. Lastly, this article did not examine the cost effectiveness or compare cost of telehealth versus face-to-face -face services. Now we will move on from questions from the audience. Our first question is, you mentioned the use of technology will allow services to reach rural areas that have less access to ABA and special education. Currently, do people living in rural areas have the resources to access different forms of technology? Are there programs that fill the gap financially? According to the Pew study in 2015, people who live in rural areas are 11% less likely to use the internet. There has been a 48% increase in rural, rural usage of the internet over the past 15 years. The FCC is currently working to include low-cost internet access to low-income families as part of their Lifeline program. Many companies such as AT&T and Charter already offer a low income option for the broadband internet. 
Second question is, is there an increasing trend in internet access in the United States? And what is the rate of increase? Yes, there is an increase. According to the Pew Research study, in the past 16 years, there's been a 40% increase in adults who use the internet and a 98% increase in adults who have broadband internet in the home. In addition to that, nearly 100% of young people in the U.S. are using the internet. And the use of the internet by the elderly has increased by 75%. The pro side has argued that the research used to support the con argument has many limitations. First of all, Powell, Buzzard, Heitzman, Rusko, and Miller in 2013 only studied four families and did not use a wide range to include adults older than 40 when showing results of telecare training. Secondly, the VR study by Forbes, Penn, and Hamilton used very limited population sample and only used an individual survey, not an observable test, to test for generalization and maintenance. As for the New But at All 2016 article, the study did not collect baseline data or follow-up with generalization or ma maintenance data, so its inform information should not be trusted. Lastly, in the Chi and Demiris 2014 article, not enough of the studies involved focus on ABA or special education to achieve the goal of supporting their argument. The pro side has shown that technology is a threat to ABA and special education services. It is a threat to the development and maintenance of IEP goals a threat to the ABA social skills treatments because it does not offer preference assessments and do not test for generalization and maintenance skills. And lastly, it's a threat to children who live in rural areas and many schools because of their lack of internet access, computers, and devices that are needed to teach the lessons demanded by the curriculum. The con side believes that technology is an asset to ABA and the field of special education. They argued that research used by the pro side is rife with its own limitations and short-sighted conclusions. The opposition estimate underestimates the demand, the, sorry, the opposition underestimates the demand for and the access to time-saving devices of online school communication for parents, clients, educators, and ABA professionals. They have also chosen to highlight just the few examples of bad software that limits the professional input instead of looking at the software that allows for many different types of input, including the cut and paste responses from official documents such as IEPs and behavior plans. Also, the studies referenced by the pro side citing teacher surveys of who in their classroom have access to the internet can be easily skewed by teacher discrimination lack of teacher comfort with the subject of technology, and lack of understanding of what the word access means. Furthermore, the con side argues that technology is an asset because it makes ABA and IEP communication and services easily accessible and manipulable to professionals. Because it makes distance treatment programs like telehealth available to families in need of ABA services who live in rural and distant areas. And because virtual reality headsets and their educational pr programs are shown to be welcomed and enjoyed by students who have autism. Furthermore, the Pew, the Pew Research Studies show that internet access is rising rapidly, even among the poor and in rural areas. There are many types of financial aid programs becoming available, and internet access is seen more and more to be a quality of life issue. Between the continuously growing demand and the in increasing rate of new educational and ABA software, the con side believes it is only a matter of time till all, if not most, school communication and therapy involves an online aspect. As professionals in the field, we need to embrace the change and work within the system to ensure that our students continue to receive the best care possible through these new types of services. In closing, there is no sufficient information that proves the threats of using technology. 
If anything, technology is the future and can benefit many that don't have accessibility to information or resources. Our group has agreed that the winner of this debate is the con side, which are the assets of using technology in ABA and special education. We hoped you enjoyed our formal debate on the threats of using technology in special education in, special education in ABA. Thank you.